Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending where you're connecting in from today. Uh, my name is Scott Snyder. I am the product marketing manager here at Amitech Crank, and I will be your host for today's uh, webinar. And of course, today's webinar's topic is around Industry 4.0, and more specifically, it's about uh, what you need to be aware of when developing embedded devices for uh, this evolving industrial market. So let's get into today's panel, today's session. So definitely in today's world, um, it would probably take less time to answer the question of what isn't a smart connected product rather than asking what is. And that is because the world has quickly gone digital and extremely connected. So really it's not a shock that many industries are looking to move away from their, their analog or manual or, or dial and switch methods to a more connected and modernized way of conducting business. So for industrial organizations, uh, this is considered the fourth wave of the industrial revolution or a term that's been coined of industry 4.0, which greatly um, encompasses IoT, uh, smart manufacturing, by marrying both the physical production and operations, of course, with uh, smart digital technology, um, machine learning, uh, big data to create a, a more connected ecosystem uh, for manufacturing and, of course, uh, supply chain management. So why is this? Well, you know, with the right level of automation and autonomy, Really, it helps businesses enable uh, faster, um, safer, and more efficient day-to-day -day operations that can really help cut their costs and improve delivery times for a more faster, leaner, and even more scalable model of, of operation. So, of course, with Industry 4.0, there's many facets to it, whether it's from collecting big data for analyzing how to run more efficiently, uh, to different regulations on how to implement everything um, into the business, um, all the way to the different components uh, that they will purchase um, that are then used to actually make the more uh, the whole industry more connected. And, and of course, the latter is where we're going to be focusing on today. Uh, we're going to be focusing on those, those next-gen products uh, that are built upon embedded platforms that are optimized for integrated technologies like IoT, uh, machine learning, AI, and all designed with a modernized um, human machine interface or HMI to really help spark business transformation. So that you know, leads me a couple of questions, like what exactly are the drivers that enable um, or the enablers behind these devices or, or what methods exist out there for updates in the field or what security aspects should be considered. You know, these are just some of the topics uh, that we will be discussing today. Uh, but first, let me introduce our panel of experts. So from Tordex, who is a leading manufacturer of high quality and exceptional reliable system on modules, we have Daniel Lang. From Boston UX, um, who is the Digital Innovation Division of ICS, uh, specializing in UX and UI design and development for connected embedded devices, uh, who create intuitive digital experiences for diverse industries from anywhere from medical to life sciences to aerospace and defense. Uh, we have Matt Ellis and Boris Savick. And then of course, from Amitech Crank, who is a global innovator in embedded GUI solutions for really helping accelerate uh, the development and design of modern user experiences uh, for uh, tomorrow's IoT devices for you know, manufacturing industries, we have Toma Fletcher. So before we get started, I'm just going to uh, quickly uh, start with the, you know, asking a poll question of everybody in the audience. So let me uh, launch the, the, the first poll question that we have here. So what is your biggest concern with developing for industrial customers today? Is it the high cost of development? 
Is it maybe the government compliance or regulations? Or maybe it's the security or privacy concerns that go along with it, or maybe it's the connectivity or integration of those connectivity uh, experiences, or maybe it's, it's developing a well-designed user experience that makes it easier and safer for people to do what they need to do. So let's jump into that first one. You should, should be seeing the poll on it. Uh, uh, Scott, it's not fair. We don't get a chance to vote in this poll. You do not. You get, you get to vote with your words. <laughs> uh -oh. Influencing the voters. That's right. That's right. All right. So I'll give everybody a couple more seconds just to kind of like, there's a lot of different elements that come into play. We just want to know what, what's, what's your biggest concern, what you're looking for. All right. I hope it's the reg regulations because I'm not sure I'm ready to speak about the regulations. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. So with that being said, um, let's uh, let's dive into the first question. So um, definitely, you know, when it comes down to it, you know, the Internet of Things and connectivity is, is really, you know, the heart of Industry 4.0. And so, you know, getting into that, you know, what, what should people be aware of and or, you know, how does this come into play in, in, in the next gen of devices? Maybe I'll toss it over to you, to Boris. Do you have a thought on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in general, as user interacts with a brand, these interactions play out over a vast network of interconnected devices. So it's not just one, you know, device or platform or target. It's really multiple. So you really, you know, as any good comic book artist will tell you, world building one-on-one -on -one is you cannot interrupt the illusion with things that are logical or out of place. So when you talk about having the sustained branded user experience across a fleet of devices, I think it's crucial that, that it really speaks together one unified language. And, you know, we think of UIs typically as living on a particular device and platform, but that's not really true. They're really more associated with the global brand that you're interacting with. Um, so from that standpoint, the game has really changed a lot it, from something that was very utilitarian, very kind of get from A to B, to really kind of looking at every second, at every interaction, at something that, that's really thought out and kind of managed on a very global level. Perfect, great. Um, how about uh, Daniel? Do you have any thoughts about, you know, how connectivity comes from as a, as a song vendor? You know, how does that kind of come into play when it come, when people are looking at your hardware? Yeah, I mean, this is a huge topic for us. So we did some surveys recently and we know that more than 90% of our customer are uh, connected. And traditionally, I think where we are in, in a lot of very critical infrastructure, industrial automation machine and so on, people were very hesitant for quite a while, but now we really see changing and people see a lot of uh, different advantages. Uh, of course, just connecting all devices, uh, they can do much smarter devices, uh, they can uh, use uh, big data machine learning to analyze a lot of data on their server side, integrated with their uh, ERP system and so on, automate uh, ordering and so on. But there is more and more uh, additional things. So people also now they have connected devices. So what can they do? They can uh, deploy uh, features in the field. So we see people now want to uh, ship products earlier because they know, hey, I can go faster to market. I can update it later. I can adjust my user interface. I can learn how people use it, then adjust it and see what they use, what they don't use, uh, and, and be there. They see that they can reduce maintenance costs. So they use device monitoring to see if there may be something wrong, if maybe uh, you know the UI maybe doesn't reach the frame rate, so, so they can fix that before it really uh, causes issue also anywhere else uh, in, in the machine. They can learn more because they get all the data, they can update faster, so they can really listen to customer and say, hey, I would like, I would love to change that on my machine, or, you know, could we, you know, simplify this or that. Uh, they can listen to it, they can, they can build it, and then they can ship it really, really fast. It's not like uh, years ago where you basically had to wait for the next revision of this machine, now they're connected. Uh, a lot of our customers are connected so they can deploy that forge. Their whole complete new business model where you hear a lot about Industry 4.0, I think that's the, that's the really 
big topic there, but uh, our customers also see that they can really increase the revenue per device. So they're not just shipping it, they get a one-time fee now, they have con uh, now they have contracts for updating security patches and so on. And then there is, there is more and more like recalls, they can reduce recalls, uh, and of course reset brand, right? They can really help uh, uh, to protect the brand, to make it easier to use. So people really love it. So there is a whole, uh, you know, promotion of, of, of your brand. Uh, even now, even reducing of CO2 footprint, right? You don't need to send your maintenance guy to go to the machine. You can update it uh, manually or you can fix stuff even before it happens that really reduces the CO2. You don't have your, your guy flying to Brazil to a, a, a car manufacturing plant to uh, fix the machine, right? And uh, also market regulation, right? You heard it before. That's really something. It's coming. Uh, we see that uh, we have quite some discussion with customers. They see, uh, for example, the Ger German government was just talking about that last week that they will make a device manufacturer actually reliable uh, if they're not updating their software and so on. So they, that's now something they worry about. It, it's coming. It's it's coming slowly. Uh, but that's also something uh, we have discussion around the whole industry 4.0 connected devices, which comes with a lot of opportunity and a lot of challenges. Yeah, what? definitely. You brought up a couple of good points there um, that were interesting. I just want to kind of go back to. So from the connectivity standpoint, you have the ability, like you said, to uh, update remotely, which reduces CO, which is always a good thing. Uh, but with helping reduce recalls, right? Because I know, uh, you know, not just a problem within industrial, but even medical from, from a, that connectivity standpoint, <laughs> anything can be done to, to help reduce recalls, which, you know, tarnish the, the brand image for the company or, or delays them. That's, that's awesome. Plus, the other interesting point that I, that I noticed is that what you said is that from a uh, ability to um, update as changes kind of come into place gives you uh, an ability to kind of keep going back and, and tapping into um, continual updates as a source of revenue uh, for business of like, oh, you need to, to change based upon a new standard. Great. We can do that for you. So very interesting. Mm. There's an interesting aspect with the, the data collection is you can start to really analyze uh, your, you know, like if you have multiple factories, you can see what, why one is performing better than another and kind of really hone in uh, on the reasonings. Um, a lot of times it, it was hard to pull out before. Now you can pull all that data into one spot and analyze it, which I think is one of the big useful things of pulling in the data from the devices instead of them just being out. And I, I also think uh, there's been a huge improvement on reducing your um, maintenance costs. Uh, like um, Daniel had pointed out is that, you know, you used to have to drive people uh, into town, uh, you know, to check on the, the things. My dad was in this industry and uh, when he started off, you know, you get a call at midnight, have to go and check on, uh, on all the things. But uh, and when he was, uh, near retirement, he, he was able to just log into his computer and say, oh, I just need to open this valve and fix the problem from home. And it, you know, I went from a, a two hour call out to uh, a, a five minute call out. So it's better both for the employee and, and for the company. So. But do you think that that's part of the historical, uh, you know, kind of the hesitancy, you know, something that, uh, that Daniel had mentioned, you know, there was this historical hesitancy to have connected devices, you know, in some senses, you know, that that convenience, right, and all those benefits that we have around these connected devices, um, you know, there's the security concern there too, right? Um, you know, being able to just remotely get into my factory is a convenience, but what about the security aspect of someone else getting into my factory and someone else controlling that valve and someone else manipulating those things, right? That's, you know, to me, that that is sort of the cautionary tale that we have is that there's a lot of devices out there that may be looking at the benefits of the connectivity story and, you know, sort of moving very quickly towards it, but not having a full appreciation of, you know, kind of what the security, um, you know, what the security requirements really are on these devices. Yeah. And that's something we're really talking uh, in the meantime, almost daily with customer, because many of our customers, they're small to medium sized companies. So they don't have a 20 uh, person security department who go through all the regulation and, you know, do uh, penetration testing and all of that. 
So what we are uh, building and they already have deployed is a platform called Horizon, where we, for example, adhere to a standard which comes from the automotive industry. It's called Optane, <laughs> reviewed. And we have, uh, you know, a team, you know, just looking at that and implementing that and, you know, coordinating uh, with this consortium, also implementing actually new standard, uh, new use cases like uh, offline updates, as is still not everybody is connected, but also that needs to be secure uh, and doing all that. So really to, to help uh, companies who do not have all these capabilities to do that themselves or maybe a little bit overwhelmed. Uh, to implement uh, over the air update solution and also a monitoring solution in a, in a way in a secure, but also reliability, a uh, reliable way. Because also in our case, industrial automation, if your factory line goes down, even for an hour, this can cause a huge amount of, uh, of damage. Um, so this is these two things we are, we are focusing on uh, a building. So it's a very uh, interesting time at the moment. It's also interesting you talked about, you know, the, the kind of the risks, but also kind of the fears for the smaller and medium companies that are kind of, we have one shot at this, right? Like we know that digital transformation is here. We know industry 4.0 is here. We got to get ready at the same time. If we don't get it right, we're looking at year or two down the road and started not just from scratch, but like further behind from where we were. So there's that initial reluctance to test the water. And I think just finding the right partner is key to that. Yeah, actually, it, it's interesting because even that 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 sense of one shot, you know, one shot to get this right, in some senses, you know, there's an education story here about the fact that actually, if you do this right, if you get the right partners, if, you know, if you get your security model in place and you actually design your applications and and you know, product in a way, you you can be you can be void of that concern, right? Because you can actually ship you know, ship products. And we see this all the time now with, you know, day zero updates, right? The first thing you do is when you install, it connects and says, hey, you know what? While I was sitting on the shelf at the store, the software development team was busy behind the scenes making this product better for you. And so I'm going to go and grab that update and I'm going to make your thermostat even smarter than it was before, right? I, I think that that's actually, you know, kind of a really intriguing proposition, but it does shift the focus of, you know, what you want to concentrate on right out of the gate, because there are some things which, you know, you want to get right so that you can update them later. Yeah. I think the first two things you have to have in place um, it is your over there updates and your security. And once after that, you can decide everything else later, but which is kind of a beauty. Um, and with having those kind of um, features, you can really disconnect your hardware manufacturing from your software development. And uh, yeah, we've seen um, many customers, you know, uh, at first we're used to tying that their uh, delivery uh, software to the hardware schedule. And then they realize, wait a minute, there is a process between when we have prototypes to when we launch and you can get a lot more features in and you can get, you know, features in as you go along. And that's a great uh, value add for customers saying uh, that that product you bought from us is going to only get better. Speaking yeah. of which, speaking of the, the products you bought from us, and we're talking about usability, uh, let's talk about simplifying the, the whole experience for users now. So let's talk about uh, why it's important to have a modernized HMI application, um, <coughs> you know, really kind of being upfront for these devices. You want to take this one, Boris, or you want me to go? <laughs> we'll, start, we'll start with you. Tom. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was muted at the wrong time. Yeah, I, I think I think you know it's inescapable, um, you know, because because part of what comes along with all this, you know, sort of new data points and uh, you know, kind of new experiences is you know, sort of that parity between all of your devices, that parity between all of your experiences, and this kind of goes hand in hand with you know what Boris was saying about your brand experience. Um, but I actually think that it can escape the boundaries of just the brand and actually say, you know, this is your personal experience, and this is what we're seeing with, you know. It was always the idea that if I'm replacing all of the buttons and dials on my product with a touchscreen, I'm going to have so much more flexibility. I don't think that everybody envisioned down the road, you know, sort of what all the benefits of, you know, a touchscreen interface versus hard buttons would give them, especially when you marry it with the, you know, kind of a network technology. But then when you start thinking about the backend data, what you can have is every single one of your products be a really bespoke user experience. And I don't mean a bespoke user 
interface, you know, this is something which is still, you need a, you need a design team to build the user interfaces for the products to be specific to those needs, but it's how you fulfill the data inside of that, right? Um, you know, if you think about large data sets, you're not just going to want to scroll through menus and sub menus and push and push and push to get all these features out. You want what's important to you to kind of bubble to the top. And actually, I think that's part of what's really interesting is, um, you know, we have this data available to us. We have the connectivity story. Now what we can do is we can marry those two things together to give you a user experience, which is very customized. And we're seeing that in the search space today, you know, constant discussions on are all those ads really generic ads or are they your ads? Well, you can have the same experience in a positive sense for any product that, you know, is going to be in your home. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think lots of good points. I think the fact that this customer experience is really getting contextualized more and more. I think it's interesting. Daniel talked about it earlier in terms of just accelerated dialogue with the user where the feedback loop is 10 times or 100 times what it used to be. And, you know, you can pretty immediately see how successful something is. So, you know, if you're ready for that, that brings a great opportunity, right? Because you can really act upon it and, and you can really make adjustments all, almost on the fly and see it happen in real time. But if you're not ready, you know, staying path is not really the same what it used to be before because you're going against a higher and higher wall of user expectations when they're like, hey, you know, this is happening. You're not doing anything about it. So, you know, you got to yeah. get with it, right? <clears throat> No, and then we're back to the uh, back to the update strategy, right? And designing your product to be able to to be live. Um, I actually, you know, I think it's fascinating if you take a look at something like a washer dryer, right? And you think about all those modes and settings. Um, you know, if you're like me, I put my clothes in the laundry, I push the button, and I, I walk away. I don't use most of that other functionality. So, yeah. you know, having to take me through the steps of doing those things, you know, can be eliminated entirely because it's like. I can see what your pattern is. I can give you access to that advanced functionality later on if you want, but I can give you a fast path right now, right here to what you want to do with the product. Yeah. And the thing that's interesting is that that's already been a pattern in personal devices. And now it's really going into industrial controls, into these yep. areas we're talking about here. <laughs> and it's interesting because some of these industries have really been dormant in terms of updates to the UIs. You know, you've had UIs that have been used for like 10, 20 years yeah. to look like your grandfather made them, right? And they never really had the impetus to change. And now they're finally getting to the point where, well, you know, it's moving around you anyway. And it matters how your engineers feel about the, the UI they need to use just as much as it matters how your customers feel about the UI that they need to use. Yeah. And I think it's not just a feeling too, right? There is that security aspect in that that what is the intuitive notion for the interface that you're presenting for the product if it's a safety concern, right? Yep. You know, if it, you know, if these are industrial machines, then I want people to be comfortable with an interface that I'm presenting to them that's not just machine specific, right? Task specific, but also matches their expectations with all of the other devices in their world, right? And I, I think that that's a, you know, it's kind of a tenuous link, but, but the reason that people get things wrong is because they have an initial mental model of what something's supposed to do. And, you know, when you approach something and it doesn't behave that way, that's where you're more likely to get errors, right? You're more likely yeah. to get, you know, sort of invalid behavioral results, even though I pushed all the right buttons. And that's yeah. been kind of the thing for us for like, you know, for prototyping and for user testing, you know, you uncover things at that point and it's like a further, pretty far down the line that you just didn't think about before. So ability to actually act upon those and really do something about yeah. it before the product goes out is key. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you guys both brought up some great points in, in, in the aspect of, of you know, the, the set of expectations that you know really help and improve the safety and even the speed of doing things because you know if you have that similar experience across devices then you know you have that perceived expectation that you know that's that's taken down that that's great uh the other thing i picked up on too is that uh you know this is, should be a scary thing to do or design because a lot of those those elements that you know you maybe have already done in other uh industries whether it's for consumer goods or whatever it may be, be that 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 uh, the engineers developing for, you know, really kind of come into play into, into this industry. Uh, 
Matt, I'm going to look to you. What, what, what's your take on it from, from a person that really has been kind of like really hands-on developing applications for, for many different verticals? Well, it's interesting in the uh, industrial spaces, a lot of the um, older kind of uh, user interfaces were uh, developed by engineers. And uh, early on in my career, I, I always wondered like what someone like Boris does with, with user experience. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, you know, it, it was my job to make it, you know, well thing, but you have to really think about your user. And even though an industry, industrial um, application is not like an end consumer, doesn't have to be as flashy as your iPhone, um, it's still important to understand how the user is going to approach it. And if you make a nice logical um, interface, it, it's going to a, a really increase safety um, because you're going to be able to stop the machine if you need to. Uh, it's going to decrease your training um, costs because uh, it will just work the way you expect it um, kind of thing. Um, and, and, you know, and a lot of people are coming now from being able to know what a touchscreen does, right? They, they're everywhere. They're in your kitchen. They're uh, in your hands. You know, they're, they're everywhere now. And, um, yeah, people just know to kind of walk up and kind of discover. And um, I think that's kind of a, a great thing that you can do is get your, um, all, everything you have to control to a point that it's easy to use. Yeah, I actually think the generational story is actually really interesting because as Morris mentioned, you know, like you have a lot of these uh, interfaces which are, you know, 10, 15 years old and then, you know, it took time to develop them to get them to that point, you know, before they even started getting used. You know, you're talking about a Windows, a, a Windows desktop user experience era, right? And so that's what a lot of these applications tend to look like. They look like desktop applications that have been slammed onto a, you know, a touch interface or slammed onto an industrial device, um, you know, that people are trying to operate. And it's like, well, that, that really wasn't the modality that you wanted to be in, right? But generationally, that's kind of where, where it was coming from. And so now, you know, as, as that generation kind of moves, moves out of the workforce and you have a younger generation kind of coming in, it is a different set of expectations that get, uh, that get imposed. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as Matt was saying, luckily, we have best practices to lean on. And it's really kind of almost the path of least resistance. If it feels weird, it's yeah. probably off. There's something that's just not right about it for a reason. Yeah, yeah. And that, another interesting thing, tying back to the connectivity is, is you can also start to um, move things to a, a, a more convenient location, right? So at times you would have to go you know, to the machine to, to get the data you need, where if you have connectivity, you can have a, a, um, a tablet or even a PC that's gathering the information and, you know, a bigger screen, um, a quieter location, uh, you know, all those kind of things help um, create better lighting even in, in some cases uh, are all things that uh, create for a, a nicer experience and uh, a more convenient experience for, for the, the users. So this is a good opportunity for me to uh, to try doing a poll again. Let me uh, where we go here. Question number two is: What elements are you planning on including in your next project? Uh, is it machine learning? Is it uh, AI at the edge? Maybe. Uh, different different modes of uh, interacting, whether it's gesture controls or voice commands or facial recognition, uh, whether it's uh, IoT connectivity, different IoT applications, or whether it's things like enhanced security or intuitive user experience. Hmm. Excuse me. So I'll leave it open for a couple a couple of minutes. Well, not a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds. All right, I'm gonna be stop sharing. All right, perfect. So let's move on to the next topic. So we kind of danced around it uh, a bit. We talked about uh, over the air, um, you know, updates, like, you know, different, uh, uh, different solutions for doing this, but I guess there's different ways that can be done, whether it's off the shelf or custom built, uh, different ones. So, so what methods are there for introducing um, system updates or upgrades uh, while in the field? And Daniel, I'm going to go to you on this one. 
Yeah, I can maybe short share my screen. Uh, so we have something else than just our faces for a, a few uh, seconds. Uh, so just here, uh, this is basically our platform, but just to show a little bit how our customers are typically used. And uh, I will come back to uh, you know, what Boris and others said here before uh, about you know, the UX is important, understanding the customer, doing testing on the customer. So here, this is uh, Horizon, it's our uh, update and monitoring uh, platform. And what it basically allows, it's forced uh, update in a very secure way, as I mentioned before, uh, security and reliability, extremely important in our uh, business. And there are a lot of different uh, over the air update solution and many of them have different targets. Uh, so the one we use, it's, it's considered a little bit an overkill because it's from the automotive. It's quite complex uh, behind the scene, but we feel because our customers are in this critical market, it makes sense. There are late, uh, lighter rate uh, solutions, uh, uh, which give up a little bit on, on certain uh, attack vectors, but there may be more suited for uh, you know, less critical IoT devices. Um, so, so that's that's a very important part. How secure and how reliable is also is. Can you? Is it okay if you break a device and maybe have to restore or send it back, or is that a no go? And where is your threshold? That stuff uh, you have to think about. So that's kind of on the way down. And then also, as you can see here, most of our systems we see in the market they also really have a way back. So you're not just update; you also monitor the device. And one. Uh, there is definitely the business information you know, to hook it up to your ERP system to learn which factory uh, is maybe more efficient as another and, and why and understand that. But what our customer, which are more the device manufacturer for these machines in the thing, also do, for example, is with UI. So they monitor how customer uh, doing the UI. And it's very important that you really think about the UX experience but at the end you are not your customer you may have some uh, you know reference customer but they're still not all your customer they may be not where the machine you know if you give them a test or you know say does that work for you it's maybe not in the real factory right because there's maybe scales there are other machines their processes how they use that maybe they put the ui on somewhere else and what what uh, our customer now really want. They want to monitor, they want to understand how customers actually use the product when they make mistakes or maybe they don't follow uh, the story as they intended it so they can understand that. Uh, they can get uh, back so they can monitor the devices, can understand how customers use it. And then they can actually report back to the developer or developers directly access. They can improve on it. Uh, put it down, make improvements, see how it works, and then getting back. And it's also typical that you have not just one fleet, you split up your fleet. So you maybe have your early adopter customers, you know, they're fine. Uh, you know, they want to have always the latest and they may be not so critical. So you have this customer and maybe you have this customer who are very serious, uh, who will not want to have a lot of changes and only want to have stuff which is highly improved. So you can split that up um, and, and, and do this. So this is a little bit how we see that uh, uh, deployed. And as I said, there are a lot of different solutions, uh, but uh, they, they have quite some differentiation, a lot of differentiation in security, also a lot of differentiation, how it's integrated with the hardware. Uh, so as a UI developer, you may be really interested in your UI, but you have to understand your system has many, many layers. So there is a UI, this application, there may be real time, uh, parts, maybe safety critical parts. There's an OS, there are bootloader, there may be other microcontrollers in the system. And you have to understand, can I update all of them? From where do I get the, the BSP, the software to update? And then all of that, that's all different kind of points you have to think about when choosing or implementing a, an update solution. Perfect. So, so you, you did mention uh, the UI there. So from an HMI's perspective, uh, Toma. So when it comes to updating the UI, like, you know, periodically or, or, or on a regular basis, maybe because regulations or, or things change, you know, what, what can, what comes into play there? Yeah. It's a decoupling, right. You know, like from an architecture perspective, you, you know, like any good architecture, you want to have the components that you anticipate needing to change in the future, decoupled from one another, you know, and that's, you know, the UI becomes one of those coupled components that you really, 
you know, it's easy to get into a mode where I'm building a product, I'm building a product, I'm building a product. And I'm thinking that it's, it's, it's going to be able to adapt to change, but there's little change and there's big change, right? And what I love about Daniel's picture here is that feedback loop, right? Where he talks about, you could have different types of customers using different types of the, the product. You know, it's really allowing us to do sort of A-B testing that you see all the time in the web world, right? Because it's a served user experience, but with an application that doesn't typically tend to be the approach. Um, but what this gives you is the ability to kind of get that analytics data back and then actually, you know, kind of run different trials and errors, um, you know, to sort of tune the experience, tune the feedback um, and tune the product, you know, whatever the product may be um, around whatever criteria you're interested in, right? But you can't do it if you don't have that decoupling, right? Because really a lot of these systems, they still need to be running, you know, the data still needs to be collected. Um, you know, if it's a health device, um, you know, you probably are disinclined to do updates while it's attached to a patient, but there's no reason why that couldn't be a possibility if you had the right software architecture. Yeah. And then on our tech, that's really also something to really see. And I think it's a very good point there, uh, you know, how to structure a UI and how you connect it with the right, uh, the rest of the system. So something we are also uh, putting an effort in it, and it was driven also by customer, uh, you know, needing that is containerization. So uh, software compartmentalization. Uh, so it's e if you do that, uh, it's easier to update your system. It's less likely you damage, you know, you have side effects if you want to update. So you don't want to, you want to, you don't want to happen that you do a UI change and then your real time, you know, robotic control or the, you know, however the robot moves uh, is affected. So uh, one way to help a little bit with that uh, is, for example, a uh, software containerization. And of course, you can go much uh, heavier with. Uh, uh, hypervisors or our system, our modules, they even have, uh, you know, different modules, uh, different microcontrollers or different CPUs like Cortex-A, high performance, many times running a local UI. And then you have, for example, dedicated microcontrollers uh, doing more the real time and, and the critical part. Uh, Perfect. So, you know, talking about application and updating the different functionality, Matt, uh, you know, do you have some some uh, take on that or some insights to, to share? Pass along. Yeah, I think um, uh, Toma really hit it uh, well, well that, you know, having a good architecture is going to help you a lot here because you, um, you need to think that not everything is going to be updated at the same time. Um, and you, you need to really look at how you're going to um, change things. And, and if you look at your roadmap and you're like, okay, you know what, in, in six months, I'm going to want to uh, roll out this feature and it's going to um, update these three components. Um, you know, how does that look, right? And, and some forward thinking on that uh, is, is usually the kind of the best approach to getting a smooth um, uh, update uh, um, and to roll out because you know what, uh, what to expect. Um, and if you, you find that things are too tightly coupled, um, you, it's better to catch that early um, and to make sure you can do things separately. So if you, like, for instance, have a communication protocol, you know, have a version number in there and make sure, you know, it can be back, backwards compatible until you can have every piece updated. And uh, you also have to think about the order you update things as, as well. And fallback is another uh, important one of, you know, uh, what happens if it goes wrong? Yeah, do, you, do you have a strategy in place to roll back? Um, because, and especially in like kind of larger deployments, you may have a very different configurations and it will work for, uh, you know, 900 sites and then you'll have, you know, 100 that um, didn't work so well. So you need to roll those ones back and kind of stop and analyze what went wrong. Um, and what was different between those hundred sites. And then that's an interesting point, right? Because your overall system, and you know, when we talk about industry 4.0, we're talking about an overall system. Your overall system has to be resilient to the fact that you may have a hundred units that are working in a different way from those other 900 units, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, so whatever, whatever the product, you know, kind of system backend story is, is that it has to be cognizant of the fact that 
the evolution of the project may be uneven, right? That you may, you know, with, you know, through the power of the over the year updates um, and through the power of, you know, kind of this mutable product, you may have a wide variety of different flavors that are sitting in your customer's hands, um, you know, and, and so being able to manage that and plan for that is something that, you know, is a reality and shouldn't be a, like a, oops, hey, we should think about this now, right? It should be an upfront cost. Yeah. So something more like it's very similar, uh, even on the same device, right? If you, you know, match OSs with, you know, all this container and, and software layers. So for example, we offer our customer to update their all separate, but we do have, especially for example, in medical, that have extreme strict uh, also testing requirements where they say, hey, we are only allowed to run, you know, this layer with that layer, with that layer, with that layer. That's, you know, what we are testing and we cannot, you know, update each component which is more agile and and the you know it can be done in a lot of other industry even in some other medical devices so uh, for example we had to actually build a system in a way where you can guarantee if the system come up if it's live it only runs a, a certain combination of uh, of software and that the customer and uh, that we can guarantee that to the customer and uh, so that's really something we, we already saw in the real world uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Now, Daniel, talk, you know, it's building upon that, and you're talking about, you know, breaking it down and, and stuff like that. You know, that the other hot topic when it comes to industry part over security, you know, so, you know, what considerations are there and how can they be addressed for this industry? Yeah. Uh, so there are a lot, and it's a really, really big uh, topic, uh, but, but very roughly, uh, how people approach that is really uh, talking about their, uh, you know, attack vector, what are really consideration uh, they can do and what kind of trust they have to have in, in a different uh, system. Uh, so, for example, uh, for us, we, we expect that our customers have very, very high requirements. So in, in our case, even if our we even have a, a tech vector where it would be that our own server gets comp compromised. Uh, but even in that case, for example, it's just a one example, uh, we allow our customer to take down uh, all their keys and everything. So we say, of course, we do a lot. We're running on, on, you know, on AWS and all of that. But even if our server for some reason gets compromised, uh, that wouldn't mean uh, the, 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 the devices uh, of our customer would be at risk. And you can, and there is many, many other steps uh, in that where, where you can say, hey, that could happen. Uh, how can I prevent that? And there's a lot of tactics like compromisations and so on. Um, you can do that. Another thing is uh, adhering to standards. So we are also, what we try is not doing everything, you know, custom and, you know, think up our own thing. You have to certify, you have to review. Uh, we are working with a lot of automotive uh, customers who also invest in that. And uh, not automotive customer, automotive companies. And they're not our customer, they have their own system, but we adhere to the same standard. So you can have that review. You have a lot of brains thinking about that. Uh, you have companies reviewing that, uh, other, you know, making a penetration testing on that. Uh, so you can guarantee that, you know, that system, that concept uh, uh, is safe against a lot of different things. But then again, you know, nothing is 100% safe. So you always have to be agile and be able if, if you know, you detect something, uh, you can fix that. And that's, of course, for the update system itself, but it's also for the, the operating system, for example, our customers. So we're doing a lot of tests. When they ship, it's probably very safe. Everything is, is fixed, but maybe three months later, somebody else finds a new vulnerability. Then you need to be in a in a in a situation where you can update uh, pretty fast. You need to have a reliable vendor of that OS who can you know prepare that for your device and then then deploy it pretty fast. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah. Anybody else okay. want to add in? Yeah, I just want to just build on on what uh, what Daniel was saying about standards. I think the other thing that's interesting about standards is that you know this notion of <clears throat> I'm not an expert in this field right now. But I want to I want to get started with my product development, and I anticipate that I may need to grow my own team in that area. And and so the, what the standards allow you to do is to you know sort of to bootstrap with uh, you know bootstrap with an expert, bootstrap with 
um, you know, consultants and, and, you know, kind of to get things rolling, but then to be able to kind of either decide that you want to take it over, you know, and that communication barrier drops. Right. And I think that's really interesting too. Perfect. Yeah. We find that when, when we start with customer engagements, we start talking about, have you thought about security? And then we start, you know, talking about the different layers, like have you, you know, thought about the, you know, data on the device, like, you know, in medical, like there's a huge concern about um, patient confidentiality. Um, you know, so there, there's, you know, th that layer, there's the layer of communication up to, to the cloud if you're connecting. Uh, there's, uh, as Daniel pointed out, you, you also have your servers you have to be concerned about. Um, so there, there's lots of levels there. And, um, and yeah, talking through with the customer, you know, those concerns, you really start to think about what, what you need to uh, control. And then, uh, then you can follow up with those standards to really implement and, and secure everything you need to secure. Yeah, the, that kind of thought about just look, making sure you're built, you're built to scale and you really build for the, pro, for the product roadmap as opposed to just solving the problems today is really key. Yeah. Because understanding how you're going to scale, understanding how that's going to happen and planning for that it, it is really kind of one-on-one, really. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that happens now with products is there's an all, a lot more imagination for the future. You know, you, you spend a lot more time maybe not worrying, worrying me is the, the wrong sentiment, but, but considering future directions that may or may not ever be taken. Right. And, and that, that's what goes into the, you know, kind of the design the architecture and how you put the product together, rather than just saying, I'm living for the moment, I'm going to put it out, I'm going to ship it. And a year from now I'll do version two and version two will have like new plastics and new this and new that. That's not the, it's not the same thinking anymore. Perfect. Yeah. That's definitely so. I can just confirm that that's really something we see uh, that people they approach uh, a life cycle of a product very different uh, with the new capabilities. No. All right. So this is a good uh, opportunity for me to uh, put the last poll out there. The last poll question. All right. So the last question is. Um, are, is your is your organization uh, planning any major digital transformation initiatives? Uh, of course, yes, within the next year. Uh, yes, but you know we haven't really kind of locked down a, a timeline yet. Uh, we're curious, just gathering information, uh, or no, not really. And so while this all comes in and and we gather up the uh, the stats. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I just want to remind everybody that, uh, using the Q and a panel, uh, to get your questions in, uh, before we jump to the Q and a section, which we'll get into momentarily. So I see coming in, I see a lot of them are just, uh, looking at it right now. They're curious to gather information. We're about 50% there, uh, about 33% of, yeah, we're looking at doing it and we have a project coming up in the next year. Perfect. All right. So. Before we get to everybody's uh, questions, let's uh, take a look. One last kind of thing I wanted to kind of just wrap it all up in a nice bow for everybody is how can this all be applied, everything we've discussed today, uh, to the modern industrial business? So whether it's use cases, whether it's, uh, you know, leveraging different partnerships, uh, streamlining the UI, UX experience, how can it all be brought together? Uh, let's, let me see. Let me pick uh, Boris. Let's start with you. Okay, I mean, we talked about it from the customer experience standpoint and that dialogue with the external user, customer, really. Um, internally, I think there's obviously increased efficiency, transparency, ability to really do so much more remotely in a distributed teams that you didn't used to be able to do and really have your devices do the heavy lifting. Ability to understand your business at different Zoom levels and when the time comes, scale much more easily. And then... You know, lastly, from a UX standpoint, really, you know, if you're designing a product nowadays, good UX is really just table stakes, you know, both internally and for internal product tools. You know, Boston UX, historically, we ran into it from kind of two sides. One was this, you know, more regulatory, heavy in usability, documented path, and so on. And on the other side was this personal device, consumer-driven, expected interactions, high-quality graphics. And we're really seeing those two kind of roads converge more and more and more. And, you know, as a designer, that's really exciting to see. 
Perfect. Daniel, take it over to you. Your parting, parting thoughts on it, bring it all together. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what we see customer really have success uh, is really bringing uh, together like the partner, like as we are here uh, together, different companies, different strengths, right? Let's say uh, our customer, they're building an industrial device. I mean, we are a some provider. So we have the hardware, we have the system on module, many times the hard, but it's not everything of the, of the system. And many times our customer have part of the knowledge. Some they're very good. They can build their own, maybe carrier board, maybe mechanical design, uh, but they may don't have UX experts on there. Uh, so they, they're looking, you know, how can I build this, you know, this pretty complex systems uh, at the moment with a lot of layers, you know, security, uh, connectivity, and they, they want to bring everything together. And, and that's really where our Toradex, we, we, we reach out to partner, we integrate, for example, Crank very easily, we work with ICS, bringing them in. We have a lot of joint successful uh, projects because our customer rarely has all the knowledge in-house. So really they can use one piece somewhere. They may be very, very experienced and very good, uh, but not everything. And, and our kind of, or something we really see, uh, people have, have success, you know, to work with partner. And the good thing, what we are really um, valued to work kind of with the same partners again, and, you know, see, hey, it worked well, you know, we know each other, the learning curve is lower and we communicate that to the customer. Uh, so, so they, you know, they can profit from that. And it's, it's easier if you, if you do something, you know, do it over and over again uh, uh, together, uh, then you get better and better. So, so this kind of, you know, connecting all that and not expecting that, you know, everybody can do everything. It's just, it's just quite, uh, quite a stack nowadays. Perfect. That. Thoughts I, yeah, I think, um, you know, it may be a daunting task to kind of start to update. Um, I think the first thing uh, I would recommend to customers is start to look at, you know, what's difficult uh, in your you know, work day today or in your processes? Um, what's costing you a lot, right? Um, these are all things you can start to look at applying the technology to make uh, life easier, make it, you know, your operations cheaper, more reliable. Um, and, you know, once you start to kind of look at, you know, your business and, you know, where you may be, could do better, um, you can start to think of how to apply the technologies. Um, and that's when you bring in, um, you know, some UX experts to figure out, you know, how, how can I make this user experience better? Um, uh, for the customer and then yeah then you start to need um, to think about you know all those different layers we talked about of um, uh, over there updates securities and um, these days I think less and less you can do easily in-house um, so it's always good to reach out to uh, different companies to pull in that expertise even just for a brief time to you know ramp up your team uh, until you, you know you you're ready to take that on, um, or maybe you don't need to take it on full time, and uh, you can always um, uh, refer to external customers and stuff. Perfect. And final thoughts. Go to you, Toma. Ah, oh, last thoughts. Last thoughts. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, what I take out of this, you know, where we are today with with the notion of Industry 4.0 is is it's really a, it's an exciting time to be building products. You know, um, and it, it kind of may sound a little cliche, but it's the dare to dream. You know, your risk factor of bringing a product to market right now, um, because of these technologies, because of the morphability of the product in the field, is so, um, you know, it, it's, it's such a lower risk, right? You can take a product very quickly to market, um, but using, you know, well-established over-the-air updates and security you know, sort of connectivity uh, solutions, you can plan for a future. And that future can be pretty ambiguous. That future can be a little bit hazy. And it doesn't stop you from getting your product to market. You don't have to actually have all of the answers. You can actually say, hey, I've got the seed of an idea. And I've got enough here that people are going to find value of it with it. And what I can do is I can give them that custom experience. And I can give them an evolving product. Um, I just need something that has some baseline essentials 
And I need to do a great job with that. And then I can build on that and I can build on that. And I, I can actually do that live in front of the customer and with them hand in hand. And that to me is what I think is really experience, you know, really exciting about where we are today is, you know, it's a very different way of thinking about how you build a product. Um, it's not just, I have to get the whole thing, soup to nuts, finished, complete and out the door. I can actually build something, bring you value and then grow that value. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right. So let me just, uh, now it's time to get to your questions. So, so if you haven't uh, put them in, now is your time to put them in. Uh, we'll go to the first one that I see is, uh, so how easy uh, is it to incorporate uh, machine learning or AI into embedded devices and it's HMI? So it seems like a two-parter right there. So uh, from a hardware perspective and, a soft, and an HMI perspective. Yeah, maybe from the, from the hardware point of view, we, uh, I can answer here a little bit. Uh, so machine learning, AI is, is quite popular and we see a, a huge range. Uh, so we, saw, we see people, they maybe process a picture every couple seconds uh, or they process some, some uh, time series data uh, pretty slow. And then we also see some very, very high performance uh, one. And uh, for us, at least, you know, for, for Tardex, uh, we really have a tooling we integrate with TensorFlow Lite. Uh, we also work with partner uh, to make sure these models are optimized for on the device. And here I'm really talking about running inference. So having a trained model uh, optimizing for an embedded device and then running on, on, the, on an embedded device. So uh, it's not that complicated, at least, you know, uh, we fast and we try to integrate and we also have this containerization. So you can have that in one container and the UI uh, in, in the other one. But then there is also another one which we, we are not so involved in so much, uh, which is you know a much AI with Industry 4.0, and that's more on the server side, right? You collect all the data, uh, maybe how your factory is doing, and then you process that maybe also a little bit offline uh, and see you know how do I can get better uh, out. Maybe you have predictive maintenance uh, algorithms which do not need to be real time uh, in the cloud, and that's also something we see. There is more about maybe data compression and you know selective uh, select the data you want to uh, push to the uh, to the server or to the cloud. Yeah, and, and nowadays we even have neural network processes on the hardware, uh, so we have now dedicated hardware which is it's really only built. Uh, to accelerate the uh, machine learning, uh, new ARM cores uh, coming out. They have uh, commands to accelerate machine learning. So everybody's really working uh, toward making that very efficient and also very power efficient. Perfect. What about to incorporate different technologies into the HMI? Uh, yeah. Go ahead and go, and go to you, Tom. I can go to you, Matt. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think you know different technologies within the HMI. The HMI tends to tends to be a a, a client of these technologies. It's a receiving the data, right? Um, you know, when you talk about you know voice commands or different modalities of interacting, um, you know, those are all standard things today. Um, they're not new. They're they're kind of well understood. Um, it's really what you're doing with the data to um, you know to kind of push that back into the product and bring value. Um, you know. Daniel's talking about, you know, using machine learning and, you know, image analysis. The great thing is that these tools are all readily available today. You don't have to do a lot of development yourself. You can go and pull a lot of off the shelf products um, and bring them together, you know, in terms of compatible partners. And that to me, I think is, you know, sort of the exciting part here. Perfect. Yeah, I, I, there's a lot of software stacks out there now for, you know, kind of, um, Connecting to give you that AI experience, um, you know, like uh, you know AWS and Azure um, stacks that even run on very low end uh, hardware, uh, which um, is a, also a great way to reduce your costs. But um, yeah, they're pretty easy to integrate now and give you a lot of functionality. Um, so you're not really inventing the wheel. So it's, it's uh, pretty neat that way. Perfect. Uh Daniel, I was wondering, what type of security options are available with uh, Tordex Songs? Is there are they baked into it? It would be more software. 
Uh, uh, both. So we do have, of course, a uh, uh, software, what I already kind of hinted uh, a couple of times, uh, but then it's also our product. Uh, they have hardware security feature. Uh, so they have a special memory. This, this supports something called like secure boot, high assurance boot. Uh, we also have assembly option and reference design for uh, TPMs, trusted platform module. Um, there are white papers uh, we wrote uh, to use other uh, uh, secure solution external ones uh, which communicate with, with the system. So depending on your application and on your needs, there are hardware and software. And of course, because we do both, uh, we can combine them uh, very nicely. Perfect. While you're unmuted, uh, does Horizon only work on Tordex modules? Uh, no, uh, of course, that's where we push it, where we uh, initially uh, really, you know, focus on. Again, also uh, from the question before that we have hardware and software uh, fully integrated, but we use uh, open source uh, product, so there's no lock-in. On the device, there is something called Horizon Core, which is basically a, a Linux operating system, and it's fully open source. And we already do have customers uh, also bringing that to other uh, devices. So you're really free uh, to move that to other ones. Uh, and then also on the cloud side, we are using uh, uh, open source tech. So theoretically, you can, uh, can also uh, build part of that uh, yourself. So we do not want to lock in uh, people uh, as, uh, so they're free and they can choose the, the best solution for their needs. Perfect. And Toma. You talked about a decoupled architecture. How would you then link your apps, control code, and tasks together? <coughs> you know, excuse me here. I need to tickle my throat. Um, there are lots and lots of different ways to uh, to go about that. Um, you know, in the IoT universe, right, the network universe, of course, TCP/IP. You know, sort of offers us a transport level. You know, and then we can build security modules on top of that, uh, you know, to ensure that we have encrypted data um, to move data around. Um, and the nice thing about that is that gives you platform interoperability as well as, you know, sort of you can use it within the platform, you know, within the system. Um, you know, Daniel talked about multiple CPUs being used on your device. Um, you know, you might be running two different operating systems. You might be running containers. Um, and this can give you, you know, sort of an easy way to move data around. Um, the other thing is, is you may have some, you know, very specific technologies that um, maybe offer a little bit higher performance um, or a little bit more um, custom nature uh, that you can use. And that would be something like, you know, for Storyboard, we have Storyboard IO, which is our, you know, kind of cross-platform universal communications um, mechanism. And, uh, and you can use that to keep the UI element independent of the data processing and then the data processing on device independent from the uh, backend server processing, right? So that you can kind of scale and, and move um, your software components around to the right spot, right? Where you need that processing to be done, right? Perfect. And so the final question of the day, uh, the person who's coming from a very limited software development background, they're using an older style WYSIWYG solution um that does native tag browsing and dedicated plc very much point and click we are you oem that builds custom manufacturing solutions for the metal forming and handling industries these are all brand new ideas for my company and we're behind the eight ball for getting started with these newer concepts so the question is is there a ground up starting point that explains the ecosystem in layman's terms That sounds like a Daniel question for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I, yeah. so really, uh, if you really want to get started, right, uh, I could pitch you, you know, our hardware, they come with a carrier board. So you get the, get the processing unit, you get a carrier board with some interfaces, maybe if in industrial, uh, you know, Ethernet, RS485, whatever uh, you choose that. 
but it also comes with a very easy way, for example, to install a UI solution like Crank. So there's a container ready. Uh, you can download uh, that uh, very easily in a, in, a few, in a few clicks. So you have that installed and, and then you have basically a base uh, you can start. You can get a feel uh, maybe for the performance you need. Maybe you, you can also get display. So you can either connect as an HDMI uh, or we also have uh, LVDS screens you, you may want to use. Uh, to, to get that feel. So you can build up a proof of concept very, very easily. And you, would you have your, all, your whole stack uh, together, maybe also controller is like soft PLC uh, software we have, in the, which is very easy to integrate and uh, maybe something you, you, you need there too. Um, and they're all containerized. So as we said before, so you can have a UI and you can have a soft PLC and you can connect uh, them uh, together. And that would be probably a good starting point. You get your hand dirty, get a feel uh, for it uh, to get started. Perfect. And I also look to say maybe either Matt or Boris from a, from a, from a maybe a consulting side of things or from you know maybe kind of getting assistance outside within the company kind of from your perspective on this particular question? Yeah, I think, um, uh, you know, a couple of things to, to look at is um, with, you know, on the hardware point, you can get, you know, uh, evaluation boards. You don't have to design your own hardware, um, which is one thing I like about uh, the Tordex solution is you get uh, some nice hardware and so software on top. Um, Crank also gives you nice demo images so you can see the UI and you can change it um, pretty easily. Um, so it's a, it's a good um, little playground between the two um, companies there to, um, uh, to start playing and getting yourself comfortable. And, and uh, we're always here to help you answer questions too. And um, uh, we, we do a lot of um, getting people started because it can be daunting um, when you don't have the expertise in the house. Um, and, uh, you know, reaching out is how, one way we can, you know, get you um, trained up and, um, and become experts. Yeah, I would also add from the user interface perspective, we've seen a lot of our engagements start with kind of a small initial engagement to just evaluate the existing system and just kind of poke holes, interview users and come up with really what we think is, is, you know, like a pretty decent heuristic analysis and evaluation of the current system. And I think that helps bridge the gap for a lot of people because, you know, not a lot of people actually start with a clear feature set in the mind with a clear idea of, of what they want to do. They're kind of loosely, I want to integrate this, this, and this, but then how it plays out, there's like a whole, you know, ascending level of documentation and just kind of statement of intent as you kind of start filling in around the, the, the gaps and, you know, that's why we see those often start with a smaller engagement that kind of exactly does that. And then people prioritize and move on. Perfect. Well, you know what, everybody, thank you for all your great questions. And thank you for taking time in your busy day to come join us today. And I want to thank all our panel of experts for uh, sharing their insights into uh, the uh, industry, industrial market, and more specifically uh, with uh, their insights into Industry 4.0. So thank you very much and uh, have yourself a great day.